case base, which, which uh, stores cases that consist of a case description, which well captures the state of the world when the problem occurs, then a description of the solution that can be applied in this situation, and the expected outcome that uh, is expected to uh, be yielded by this uh, solution. So when the problem occurs, our twin tries to achieve a case that is as similar as possible to um, the problem at hand and tries to reuse the solution. And then it uh, observes whether applying the solution was successful or not. And if that was not the case, it also learns that for this specific so uh, situation, the solution does not work. So the case base grows over time. Um, and the general process for developing digital twins that are domain specific uh, that we propose in the paper um, is model driven. So we um, have our domain expert, which can describe the domain in which the specific machine, which we plan to twin uh, operates. And he or she describes this uh, system and also how um, the digital twin can access the API of the system for it to send actual commands to the system if necessary. Then uh, we provide a set of templates that can translate these um, descriptions into general purpose code. In our case, that was Java. And um, this uh, Java code is also extended by further handcrafted uh, solutions if necessary. So our generated code can be combined with other handwritten functionalities if necessary. We also provide the case-based reasoning framework and then our domain expert describes um, cases that he thinks might occur on the specific machine and provides these cases um, to the digital twin. And at runtime, the digital twin can then process these cases and react to situations if necessary. So uh, why should you read our paper? First of all, there you can find a detailed description of the whole architecture and the generation process. Um, formal definitions of all languages that we developed and used and um, how these languages uh, were used by the domain experts also. And you also find a description of our use case, which was an injection molding machine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, the audience knows that they can write, start writing questions in the chat. And then we, we discuss all the papers in the end. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, so now we go to the second presentation that is presented by, by Paul Dean, a PhD student at Lancaster University that will be presenting their work in exploring the design space of emergent scheduling. Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, right, there we go. Um, okay, yes, so hello everyone. Uh, I will be presenting uh, our work, which is looking to explore the design space of emergent scheduling for distributed execution frameworks. Uh, so to begin, uh, distributed execution frameworks such as Spark are a popular approach for the execution of user submit jobs at a data center scale. Uh, a user submits a job which is broken into individual tasks and the scheduler decides which order task will be executed on. Uh, with the goal to ensure that the maximum amount of jobs are submitted, scheduled and executed efficiently with a good placement. Uh, this has made scheduling challenging as the order of arrival, length of a job, the search for the best placement and the required data are initially unknown and create different deployment conditions. Um, the challenge of scheduling within a, a framework and the overall performance improvement gain has inspired numerous approaches. As efficient scheduling affects the completion time of jobs, reducing miniature hours from the overall computation. The approaches at a higher level may be classified as policy-based approaches. Uh, this would encompass the first three listed, uh, where the approach is fixed on the design uh, and used to a single policy or architecture, uh, or as offline training approaches, which would encompass the fourth. Uh, where we use a collection of representative workloads to train the scheduling approach, which then becomes fixed at deployment time. Um, in this paper, we propose an approach that uses online learning with adaptation at runtime. 
uh, we compose, compose our approach from various building blocks and each of these building blocks has points where, where adaptation uh, can be performed that would change behaviour. Uh, in this instance, our behaviour is the scheduling policy we use in our approach. And this gives us the potential to learn from each workload as it arrives in order to understand which approach is best at runtime. Uh, in this paper, we have three research questions. For question one, we ask the theoretical dimensions uh, within, a schedule, within a scheduler. Uh, looking at the scheduling policies, uh, such as FIFO or FIRST schedulers, and the architectures, such as centralised or decentralised. Um, for questions two and three, there is an empirical focus on looking at which scheduling policies correlate to certain workload types, and if we identify points of correlation within a workload, <clears throat> can they be used as adaptation points at runtime? For research questions two and three, we created a real system, which was run on a data center testbed. Our first result, shown in the top right graph, shows that there are divergence points within workload types, which may offer improved performance. Our second key result, seen in the graph to the left, shows that there are clear potential points where adaptation may be performed at the job or task level, as there is enough information available at runtime to accurately detect these points. Um, to summarise, the results found show there are divergence points within workloads themselves and points within the framework which may be used to, uh, for informed adaptation. Future work looks at building the controller element of the system for the management of adaptations and to also look at other points within the framework for adaptation at a task level uh, and as well as adapting the schedule's architecture. Um, this concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, now we, we move to our third presentation um, that is presented by Ines. I hope that I'm saying the name correctly. It is a, a postdoc at Paderborn University and is going to present their work in enhancing human in the loop adaptive systems through digital twins and VR interfaces. Ines, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. We are not listening to you, Ines. I, you, I think that you are mute. I hope you can all hear me right now. Sorry for the uh, uh, uncertainties I have uh, uh, considered here. Um, I was not expecting that this happens, but anyway, let's start with the pitch presentation. My name is Enes Yitbash, as mentioned already from Nuno. Um, I'm from the Paderborn University and on behalf of my colleagues, Kadirai Karakaya, Ivan Jovanovic and Gregor Engels, I'm going to present our work on how to improve human in the loop adaptive systems by using digital twins and virtual reality interfaces. So uh, let's start with the motivation. Um, so most of the existing self-adaptation approaches usually rely on closed loop controllers um, that avoid human intervention from adapt uh, adaptation. And uh, however, there are situations where human involvement is beneficial or even necessary. So um, if you look at the different uh, stages of the mid K loop, uh, a human can, for example, act as a sophisticated sensor uh, as, uh, as a decision maker to improve the analyze and plan uh, phases, and also as a sophisticated actuator, or also um, on the stage of knowledge augmentation. Um, so it is at different stages helpful to, to uh, have a human participation in this loop, um, but this has uh, several challenges um, which have to be considered when we want to integrate the human and the MAPE-K loop. Uh, and uh, we have especially identified two main challenges. The first one is um, transparency. And uh, transparency means um, that, that the humans need to understand what is going on in the autonomous system, as well as it's in, in its context. And uh, the humans should be provided with feedback as explanation and with visualization about the system state and its, uh, and its co uh, context. And what is even more important is to not give uh, this context information in a 2D representation, but in a more spatial uh, context by conveying also 3D related or spatial information. 
That's why we are uh, using um, virtual reality interfaces, where I will come later on. So the second important challenge is controllability. And here, uh, it is important to manage the degree of controllability. So human control versus mixed initiative. And also the question, how can we incorporate human input in the decision-making and adaptation process so that these uh, steps are uh, done in a natural and interactive way? Um, so the, the central question uh, with this is, uh, how can we um, come up with a solution which is natural and interactive in a way, so from the perspective of human computer interaction that gives the best benefit to control the, uh, the, the self-adaptive system. And to, to better understand this, we have the following example scenario. Uh, imagine a robot system which uh, operates on an assembly line. So the task of the robot is to put various objects together to build something. Um, however, the positions of the objects or the obstacles in the environment can dynamically change. And uh, therefore, the adaptation corresponds to changing the robot arm's motion trajectory, depending on the safety criticality of the domain, varying degrees of human supervision can be required to intervene in this motion. In some cases, I would like to prefer more autonomic uh, control of the robot, so more self-adaptation uh, of, uh, of the self-adaptive system. In some cases, uh, I would like to take over the control as a human because I need more preciseness or uh, I have other concerns. And therefore, um, now the central question is, how can we support transparency and controllability for such self-adaptive systems to uh, uh, um, support human in the loop adaptation? And uh, as a solution idea, uh, we came up uh, with the following idea. So to support transparency, uh, we are creating a digital twin representation of the actual environment. So the real robot is uh, represented uh, as a digital twin with all its, its physics and with all its uh, realistic uh, representation, how you could see it in the real world, you can see it in the virtual world. And um, this virtual environment then can be accessed and controlled through an intuitive and immersive, immersive remote control by using virtual reality technology. And the advantage of virtual reality is that we really uh, are immersed in this uh, scene, that we see the self-adaptive system, in our case, this, this, uh, this robot, that we can see its context, and that we can control this uh, system through different ways. And for this purpose, we have uh, implemented uh, two uh, different uh, control strategies. One um, human control, fully human controlled control strategy in the VR interface, and one uh, mixed initiative control approach which are uh, analyzed uh, in our uh, work. So all the details you can find uh, in the paper. I will not go into the empirical analysis part of this, of this work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ines. Okay, so we move to the last presentation by Nicola Franco uh, uh, from, uh, from Fraunhofer, uh, ESK. Um, and the work is towards a self-adaptive architecture for federated uh, learning of industrial automated automation systems. Nicola, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Can you yes, see the screen? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, uh, I'm Nicola. I'm a research engineer at the Fraunhofer Institute for Cognitive Systems. This is a um, presentation of a short paper uh, towards a self-adaptive architecture for federated learning of industrial automation system. Uh, so just a brief introduction of what uh, federated learning is. So we have a distributed system composed on several devices, which are connected to a central cloud server. Each device has its local data sets composed by measurements and labels. The federated learning it's a um, training procedure where at the beginning um, for, it's a training procedure for machine learning models so we can consider that uh, omega it's a machine learning uh, the uh, weights and are sent from the central cloud server to each device at the first step uh, each device compute um, optimization uh, in, uh, with its local data sets in order to improve uh, the model and then send the model back to the central server for for a global aggregation and then this uh, procedure uh, iterates uh, several times according to the accuracy that i need 
in our work, we are considering um, a smart industrial scenario where um, in this case, we are considering factory connected to a central cloud server and each factory is composed on, on several smart industrial devices. And the factory has its own data sets that is different from the other factories. Um, in this framework, we start from a federated aggregation at um, cloud level. Then we solve a problem uh, through decentralized optimization that I will show in the next slide. And we train the model according to the previous solution. Then we can choose between a local iteration or a global aggregation. Here, the, the, previous, the, the problem we formulate in this way. So it's a multi-assignment problem where we have the devices on the left-hand side, which are computing um, loss function in each part of the data set, split it into a number of subsets equal to the number of devices. So the problem is um, it's this one, according um, um, subject to two constraints. The first constraint is that each device has to be assigned to at least one subset. And the second one that each subset has to be assigned to at least one device. And we want to minimize the loss for all the devices in all the subsets in order to have a better, a better model. And this is a map K overview. So starting from the monitoring phase, each of the device um, compute the, the loss function into to its uh, local, into a local, uh, local data set. Uh, local subset and compute the mean between the previously computed loss function. The analysis take place uh, at the factory level, so into a master. So we are sending the models and the loss into, um, into a master. And uh, we are comparing all the models, all the previously modeled uh, trained models for, uh, from the devices and pick up the, the one that has uh, the, 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 um, the minimum loss, so the, the best one. And then the adaptive process um, decide uh, if they're doing a um, global aggregation or a local uh, iteration. In this case, the global aggregation aggregates uh, all the model between all the factories. In, instead, the uh, local uh, iteration split the data sets into a number of subsets equal to the number of available devices and um, run a decentralized optimization in order to solve the previous uh, multi-assignment problem. And then the, the, the device can uh, optimize the model into the chosen data sets. Those are preliminary results in which uh, we, uh, our model is the self-adaptive compared to a baseline, the federated averaging. In this case, um, the behavior of our model um, changes according to the local iteration and a global aggregation that jumps up the model. Um, this has been compared for different number of factories and different number of devices uh, with um, means data sets only for the training procedure. Feature direction are evaluating for different data sets, uh, considering adversarial nodes, uh, different data sets and non-identical independent distributed uh, data, considering adversarial nodes, um, asynchronous aggregation where uh, different devices can send the model at different times, and aggregation for different number of devices and communication errors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, now we open the floor to to questions. Um, thanks to, to all the authors. OK, so let's start. There are a few questions in, in the chat already. Um, uh, Danny, maybe you, you can start to, with your questions to Manuela. Uh, hi, Manuela. Thank you for your talk. Uh, so as you can read there in the chat, I was wondering, it seems you're focusing really on the design and the development of uh, these digital twins. So I wonder whether you also consider any runtime activities in your work, or is this something you consider later on? Or what? I wonder just. Okay, first off, yes, this, uh, this work currently uh, focuses on uh, design time activities. So how do I create a digital twin in such a way that it is also quick and can be adapted to specific domains and specific machines even? Um, but what do you mean by runtime activities? So in another paper, we described how we actually operated a generated digital twin on the machine. So we do have runtime activities 
No, I just wonder in the work you presented today, you have some kind of feedback mechanism, mm -hmm. but it is all playing at a development time. And usually, I, I'm not saying this is not interest because I've seen papers that do adaptation in a very different way as that the community usually is doing adaptation. Usually when we talk about cell adaptation, most of the papers are doing these adaptations of an underlying system at runtime. But in your case, you are doing that in fact in parallel probably with a running system to update it or whatever other evolution step you want to make. And you use basically a feedback loop to realize this evolution step eh? to, to, to develop the, the digital twin you need for that particular domain, right? Um, yeah, kind of, but we also adapt the real system because our digital twin represents the real system. So if we change settings within the digital twin, then these settings will be also changed on the underlying side of physical production machine that we have running. So, so while, while, your work, while your adaptation process is going on, your digital twin is connected with the real system and the changes are enacted on the fly, right? right. Okay, so that was not- So the twin can send an actual command to the API of the production machine and change okay. the settings that are I, 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 I'm sorry, I missed that part. It explains a lot more. Thank you very much. Very nice work, okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, Rogerio, please. All right. Um, this this was one of the few occasions that Danny confused me with these questions, actually. Right. So uh, and and uh, I think when I underst understood from your problem, uh, Manuel, uh, from your solution, is that you, you you choose on the fly the cases, correct? The cases you use on the fly. You've got several several cases in which, depending on the data, you choose on the fly, correct? Or choose one one appropriate case among twenty five whatever cases. Start with an initial case base, and then um, we start from that base and look for the most similar one. Yes, yeah, similar one. Mm -hmm. So, what my question was around the similarity. Mm -hmm. All right, um, because you're looking for similar. What is the impact of similarity in 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 in, in deploying the appropriate case? Because you might be the, might be the situation in which you select a case. All right which is not perhaps enough similar for the piece you're trying to come up, right? So what, what, are the, what are the analysis or what are the evaluations you do before you actually the operator press the button and goes ahead uh, in the situation that the case doesn't match, is not similar enough to what you want to produce or the, the operator wants to produce? Mm. Okay, so we have two cases. First of all, we find a similar case. It has not to match exactly, but what we consider similar enough, which is when uh, the similarity value is beyond a certain threshold, then we try to uh, apply the solution that is described. And then the twin observes whether uh, applying the solution was successful or not. So um, after that, we will have a new case that is matched exactly to the situation um, that has been initially uh, caught been causing the problem and with an expected outcome, which was what happened then after applying the solution. So uh, we have the case that this specific case might not have yielded the solution that uh, we expected. Okay, so what you're saying that actually you generate the cases during runtime. You might adjust a case and generate a case, all right? And with that, if for the same situation, the same, the same data, whatever you generate now, the you not generate, you use the case, the updated case, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so your similarities essentially tend to tend to increase by, by doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for clarification, Manuela. Manuela, um, uh, another clarification that Mark asked in, in the chat uh, that may maybe other listeners want to see clarified. What, uh, what are the kind of adaptations that you perform? Do what kind of properties you change. Can you, can you clarify a bit on that? So generally, the digital twin can change all parameters of the machine that a human operator could also change via the user interface. So if the operator goes and changes, for example, the amount of raw material which is to be injected into the mode, when speaking of an injection molding machine, because that was the use case, um, 
then the digital twin can also change the setting. And then, of course, typical values that we change are the temperature regions within the heater and um, some um, parameters of the raw material which are used. Okay, thank you. I think now it's a little bit more clear. Okay, involving the other speakers also, uh, Rogerio had a, a question to, to do to, to the second speaker, to Paul. Uh, Rogerio, do you want to do the question yourself? I don't want to take the thing. Can you, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, what would be the impact of changing the scheduler algorithm during runtime? Uh, um, so, yeah, it comes in like two separate answers. The, the simplest answer would be that because of the underlying programming language that's being used, it's using the Dana programming language, uh, which is uh, component-based and uses a metaprogram and required interfaces. These adaptations are seamless and uh, sound and are performed at runtime with very little latency, if at all. Um, uh, a much more detailed answer is that it takes these individual wires that connect these interfaces and they are re-resolved during the runtime itself using the meta program uh, and any function passes that have been made are somewhat isolated and passed to the next so as soon as the wire has been changed previous functions are still performed as if there is no delay uh, so it's it's seamless it's at most would be millisecond but that's pushing it, it it's very very little latency Okay, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, no, no, but I, I'm had problems with my computer with my thing here. So, Paul, what my concerns is that because you found you changing the scheduler, all right? Yes. There is clearly a discontinuity there. Of course. All right. So, and that discontinuity, discontinuity might have, uh, might affect how other tasks are going to be executed. Right? Um, yes, yes. So, and that is not a question of the timing. The, time, the switching right. time is not a problem in real time, oh, okay. this type of systems. The, the, time, the, the, the problem is when you switch, you might have actually implications on the value, where you have got implication which tasks are going actually to be uh, scheduled, all right? Um, and, yes, that's, yeah. and that wasn't clear from your, your presentation. Right, okay. Um, so if the scheduler is adapted at runtime, the previous decisions made are uh, still committed, uh, but the effect that this may have on the next workload that's given is something that still needs to be fully explored and is actually an interesting point uh, with the adaptation itself. Um, so it's at the moment presumed to be I know, but dependent on the workload that's changed, it could have a larger effect and it's something that's being explored uh, with the controlling agent itself. Um, all right. So it looks like that you've got the notion of a QSIN state then. All right. So yeah. you're trying to finish all the processing, all the, all the, schedule, all the tasks that are scheduled on yeah. the previous, uh, previous scheduler. And yeah. once they are finished, you start a new scheduler. Is that correct? Um, so that would depend on when adaptation is performed. So ideally in a, a, a somewhat relaxed learning environment, you, you'd look at seeing how these various workloads can be used for each scheduler. Um, but in real time, if uh, adaptation is seen to be performed for the next four items in the queue, then it will be performed at that instance. Uh, it, it won't wait. It, it's entirely dependent on the controlling agent. Uh, which is why it's the next step in the research. All right, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay, so um, to involve Nicola also, uh, no, no uh, first Enes, and uh, to not be Rogerio again asking a question, I have a, a, gen a general que a question to, to Enes. So you are um, trying to enhance the human in the loop um, in, in these systems with digital twins. My question is, is kind of, of conceptual. Um, as you introduce human in the loop, the, the, the unpredictability of the, 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 post, the, the changes of the, 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 what might happen uh, grows. So it, it, the system becomes more unpredictable and the, these with digital twins may may not be how to say can escape a little bit control to what point you are concerned with these 
with uh, so the the the, woman, the, woman, the human is in the loop is doing actions that might be more unpredictable and less precise and you are trying to to how do you maintain your digital twin accurate so indeed this is a complex problem to um uh, characterize not only the self-adaptive system but also the the whole context information um, in the digital twin and its environment is it's very complex so we started with a with a basic setup where we had the robot and uh, some um, objects and some obstacles in the scenario but for future work of course we need more sophisticated uh, methods and techniques how to um, uh, reflect the whole system and the real world scenario uh, in the digital twin uh, in environment and the virtual environment so that we can not only observe uh, it but also control it um, with the means we uh, I have uh, uh, sketched in my presentation. Okay, okay. So for now you are trying to reduce the, the scope. Uh, okay, uh, maybe Rogerio, uh, um, maybe your, your question for, for uh, Enes now. Uh, Enes, um, all right. Um, okay, I've got to do a disclaimer first, all right? My disclaimer is very simple. I like humans. I love humans. I've got nothing particular against humans, all right? And, uh, but usually I try to remove the humans from the loop, all right? So, and that's my, my, my issue. So what essentially I couldn't understand for your approach, all right, is that you're putting humans in the loop. All right, and that start introducing issues there. All right, I don't know why Danny didn't pick up this one. All right, so start introducing issues there, which there is no reason for control loop. We don't have a control loop anymore. All right, and uh, and we've got some 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 problems afterwards. But you see, why are you deconstructing the feedback to control loop essentially? Yeah, in some cases, uh, the human. Uh can have the better uh, or more sophisticated uh, functionalities regarding uh, monitoring um, analysis plan and execution. And in some cases, the, the human uh, capabilities are better. So um, that's, that's the reason why we are uh, trying to design or uh, keep things different in our approach. And uh, the advantage is then that we are trying to give a, a very immersive um, uh, characterization of the system and its context so that uh, the, the human is not only aware about the situation, but can interact with the system like the system is it's nearby. Or maybe the system is, uh, is in, a, in a hazardous situation or far away, it can interact with the, with the system in a very interactive uh, way as it is in the same uh, space. Yeah, but I'm going to give an example to you. I don't know, in the process of analysis, let's say there is analysis using a probabilistic, uh, uh, a probabilistic stochastic algorithm, uh, uh, stochastic algorithm or multi-checker, probabilistic multi-checker. How can a human understand or right, influence that analysis? Yeah, so- understand? And that is the problem for me, all right? And the problem is that the, also the human might change and set up the outcome of the analysis. And that has got negative effects on the full control loop. I, I can fully understand uh, your point. Uh, I, I uh, share the, the same opinion, but uh, with, with the capabilities of virtual reality, we have uh, uh, the possibility that we can um, also visualize complex data, so complex de decisions uh, in a very intuitive manner. So um, also we have tried to um, uh, explain as the decision-making process in the virtual reality interface so that uh, the, the, the human better tries to understand what has happened uh, in the decision-making or analysis process. So we think that this is a first starting point to better help the humans, but um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a just a beginning. We can of course uh, use more sophisticated visualization uh, strategies and techniques uh, from, from virtual reality technology to better convey the most relevant uh, and important uh, in information for the human. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now uh, a question to, to, to Nicola to also involve him in the discussion. Uh, 
um, uh, Danny mentions that that the, the, the presentation of Nicola is a, a nice example of of he, he is referring to the very first presentation of of the first day of of Sims, uh, uh, and then the question. So Ines, maybe maybe you can do your question to to Nicola, please. Ines Valentin. Yes. Hi. Uh, so, from my understanding, you consider that the devices in a factory uh, always have access to the same partitions of the data set, and that is fixed uh, throughout execution. Um, would it make uh, sense to uh, also monitor and try to adapt how that partition uh, is made? And uh, do you have any idea of how that could affect uh, the results and the efficiency of your uh, approach? Yep. So a good question. So um, in this case, um, in our um, experimental, we used a specific data set in which the samples are identical and independent distributed. In a, um, a real uh, scenario in industry, the data cannot be um, considered in the same way. So um, until I'm using this kind of assumption, um, I can um, um, I can be rely on the training procedure. So um, so the, the, the training procedure will lead to to a good result. But in a in a real uh, data sense uh, with um, time varying uh, data in that case, probably the training procedure will not um, rely on a, on, a, on a good training. So I need to, I need to compare uh, the data of the time T plus one with the previous one in order to, to see if they, they have, uh, uh, they came from the, the, the same distribution. Um, yeah, um, this is a good point and probably need more refinement and uh, um, a practical um, um, test. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, a question of, of Manuela to Paul. Manuela. Um, I watched your video and I really liked it. So I had one question because at the end you mentioned that you plan to involve some self-adaptiveness into the scheduling. Um, so, what kinds of adaptation mechanisms do you think of when you say that? Um, so, was it referring to the point with the multi-tier scheduling, just to clarify? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so with that at the moment, when we're looking at informing scheduling decisions of adaptation, we only look at the scheduling decisions made in the resource manager itself. So, that's a, a single node which encounters all workloads submitted. Um, so what we plan to look at in future is uh, a much lower level in the system. So that would be the application master itself, which controls the scheduling of the individual tasks of each job. So we'd be looking at adapting the scheduler used for sending these tasks to different executors that are controlled by an application master. So it would be somewhat of a, a similar learning method that would be applied in the resource manager but with a lot more uh, reliance on it being uh, very low latency where the resource manager can have a bit more time with its decisions. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So Ingrid. Um... Okay, so I was waiting for making my question because it's a more general and philosophical question. So um, I would like to use the opportunity that I have many experts in the industry 4.0 in the session. Uh, so I'm, I'm knowledgeable in the topic. So I learned uh, not so long ago about this term digital twin. Uh, and from my understanding, it is like a software representation of something physical in a uh, uh, in, in, in an industry. And then you have sensors and you have uh, actuators. And essentially I come from the area from, of multi-agent systems and that's actually the definition of an agent. Um, and lots of research has been done like considering this notion of software agents. And then I wonder what are the 
particularities of the domain, like industry 4.0. So what are, is it just uh, an application domain where we can do applied research? Or is it the case that we have uh, uh, particular uh, research questions that are specific to this domain? Uh, so then when I listen to the talks, I, I try to abstract and think, what is the research question, like more general? And sometimes I get confused, I don't, I don't understand. So uh, it's, it's more like a philosophical question, what would be the difference from between digital twins and software agents? What are the research problems from your work that uh, is not specific to the domain? How would, would you define that? Uh, so uh, it's it's more like a, a discussion than than an actual specific question, and it's to all the authors. Okay, one thing that I can think of spontaneously is that in production we usually have very long lifetimes of machines. So a production machine might be thirty years old, and uh, thirty years ago they didn't equip it with much sensors. So we are kind of blind and need to post integrate sensors for it to become um, monitorable by any software system. So that might be a difference to other domains. Okay, any other takes to, for, uh, to the, for the question from the authors? I, yeah, I was thinking in the same direction. So probably um, in case of digital twin, you're doing like a predictive maintenance of the system. So you're not really acting on, on the system. Um, um, most of the time you are just uh, predicting if there are possible failures in order to, to satisfy some safety co constraints. Um, maybe from a software point of view, uh, in case you have an agent, then the agent is really applying um, or changing the environment all the time. So maybe yeah, this is uh, probably one of the difference between digital twin and um, agents like in the multi-agent system uh, since from um, a software point of view. So, so in this case. Okay, uh, uh, one, one simple follow up fr from me on this sequence. Can we also assume that some of these uh, uh, systems uh, uh, are, uh, uh, how to say it, uh, le uh, although they are quite complex and involved physical work, are less complex than, uh, than uh, large uh, software systems? Is, is this assumption true or not so much? I don't know if, if, if any of the authors have uh, By these uh, systems, you mean digital twins? The the so the the the, the manufacturing uh, systems that that you are uh, uh, how to say that you are uh, uh, monitoring with uh, that you are uh, using the the twins to to simulate things. Probably is not a very good assumption. No? Okay, so we have a, a few more questions to, to move on. Uh, Jenaina, uh, you, you wrote a question uh, a lot of time ago. Uh, do you want to, to pose your question to, to Enes? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anuno. Um, so yeah, um, one thing is related, I think then Danny uh, uh, made a, make it even more generic, which I thank Danny for that. Uh, but before that, I was wondering if Benny's work could be re related to one robot. I mean, these a uh, human and one robot, or do you mean like uh, interact with a group of robots? Um, you use here, as I understood, the PDDL for planning, and then you use AI to devise what the plan to be deployed, uh, which is not really, um, I, I don't know how complex that should be, but... I was wondering how much you need that for one robot and how much you need that for a group of robots. But I understand that um, bringing the idea of uh, these uh, interaction between the human and the robot in this kind of virtual environment, it looks nice. Uh, but I know there are many more constraints to be considered, especially when you 
uh, consider um, the interaction between robots and the role of the human in this interaction, which uh, goes to what Danny follows in the question um, as for what's the role of the human in this adaptation issue. So uh, there are two questions here, I know, uh, but what I mean is um, the, 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 um, uh, when you talk about adaptation, so I guess the challenge here, uh, it should go in a, let's say, uh, in a way that you justify why you need the adaptation here, not the interaction between one, ho one human and one robot, right? If it's not that clear, I can I can can further clarify. But I hope um, I I made my point. So I just can try to clarify our initial scenario we have focused on in in our work. So it was a stationary robot uh, with uh, one human controlling it, but uh, the solution was designed in such a way that is it is uh, generalizable also for. Uh, more humans and more, uh, more robots collaboratively uh, interacting with each other. So that's why we have also used uh, this PDDL approach. Um, so to, to be able to also manage more complex uh, scenarios where we have uh, obstacles between these uh, different uh, stakeholders in, in the real world scenario, which are then reflected in the virtual world so that we can, um, so to say, argue about, the, uh, about what is happening uh, in the real world, also in the virtual world. Um, so regarding the, regarding the question in the chat box uh, about the battery level and move constraints, of course, this has to be considered when we have the mobile robots, um, power, energy consumption, etc. These are aspects which then, of course, have, have to be integrated uh, in our, or, or extended in our approach. But this, is current, this was currently not the main focus of our approach. It was more about how can we come up with, uh, with, uh, with a novel virtual reality interface to support the basic uh, steps in uh, human in the loop participation. That was uh, the main goal at the beginning. Yeah, OK. So, so yeah, so then I, I come back again to the question of Rogerio. So uh, what is the role of the human here? Uh, I don't know. Um, I see motivation, nice interaction here when you have like the human in the loop here. But um, yeah, we might need the human here, but I don't know if the problem is clear enough for you to justify having the human here in the loop because it, it gets uh, way too complex for you to consider here. The presence of the humans, not to mention the complexity of having the robots um, in their own domain and the constraints and all the adaptation issues that they have to face. Uh, but but I, see, I, I see the contribution here more towards um, how do you integrate the human in the loop in all this virtual environment as one. But it's just that the adaptation itself is not that clear to me what's the role of the human here. So maybe, um, maybe there is a clear case here that you guys have envisioned. But... Uh, I see in the paper, there's one part that you mentioned, that you guys mentioned here, um, when you talk about um, the new cases of adaptations um, that you didn't have an adaptation plan. So probably in the lines that Manuela mentioned before, um, when you, you deploy um, the solutions in the digital twins once, um, you, you, you have the, um, the planning for them, right? So, so maybe this is the thing that you may help um, like the configuration space or adaptation space actually. When, for example, uh, there is a situation that has been not foreseen and maybe there is a, a direction that need to take and then maybe humans can explain better than the machine have a solution for them, exactly. right? Exactly. Maybe this could be the case. Maybe this, but but this kind of motivation. I'm I'm sorry, but it was not clear to me uh, from the presentation or even the beginning of the paper. But it's nice. I I think there is a there is an interesting direction here to go. So Thank you. I, I just would like to um, suggest to to look into the uh, longer presentation where we have also embedded some videos of our VR interface with the different control strategies. So for me, it was. Uh, and uh, not uh, in time so to present both videos in the pitch presentation. So uh, if you are interested, uh, take a look, please. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So uh, I, uh, there is a, an interesting discussion going in the chat. I, uh, um, we have a few minutes. 
I, uh, Elias will make a question that is not related to that, and then uh, we will uh, use the last few minutes discussing what we are, what is going on in the chat. But Elias, yes, please. Thanks. Uh, the question is for Nicola. Um, so try to be uh, fast uh, in asking. Um, thanks for bringing a federated learning to Sims. Um, my, I may have missed it, but I did not really understand the um, how federated learning would be adapted by your approach. I understand that you frame federated learning as a as an adaptation problem or an adaptation solution using Make K, but are you using also some techniques to uh, tweak federated learning at runtime? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So since uh, the, the work is a working product, so it's a towards um, self-adaptive architecture. Um, in this case, the adapt pro uh, the adapt process um, change uh, between the the global aggregation of the server where all the factories send uh, the models and the weights that they have internally trained. Um, or or changing to um, local iteration. So and where um, the the um, the problem is modeled as a multi-assignment problem, then it's solved uh, locally for a certain amount of iteration. So, um, this uh, yeah, this approach um, um, is, is um, look at this part as a self-adaptive, uh, mainly between the analysis and the planning. The monitoring and the execution st uh, um, stage are mainly fixed, and. Um, so this is my um, can I can first, I interrupt? Yeah. Sorry, just just to explain one thing. I I understand what you're saying. Uh, it's just that wouldn't it make more sense to uh, consider the federated learning as it is, uh, as a managed system, so to say, and then okay. use an adaptation loop on top. You know, because federated learning uh, has a lot of uh, parameters. I guess uh, I haven't looked into it. <laughs> I have to say, I just know what it is. Uh, but uh, you probably can tweak many things here and there. Would it make sense to have a runtime loop to tweak those things? I guess that would be an interesting thing for adaptation, right? Yeah, sure. In that case, uh, you need to formalize uh, with more constraints and with more um, uh, variable as well, the problem, because you're taking into account communication errors with devices. You're taking mm -hmm. into account that not all the factories are connected or synchronized. And in that case, uh, you can uh, build a um, map K loop even on the top of the cloud system so maybe uh, yeah so you have will have two control loop one on the factory level and one on the cloud system and in that case uh, yeah could be could lead to a more complicated problem as i think um, um, federico presented in the one of the first uh, talk mm -hmm. they they described the, the problem with um, multiple constraints and a more detail, detail, detailed way that i did yeah you're mm -hmm. right thanks thanks thank thanks. you Thank you. So uh, we have just uh, uh, a little bit of time more. Uh, I, I would like to, to, I don't know if Danny wants to, to bring the, the question that, uh, that caused all this chat to, to pose this question and then some of the authors uh, reply or, or uh, other people express some, some opinions on that. Uh, Danny, can you, can you bring it forward? Yes, uh, but I would like to say one sentence to, to Nicola and the discussion we just ended. Uh, it is interesting if you look at what Thomas Bures yesterday was saying in the community debate about this marriage between learning and self-adaptation. So the question Ilias was saying and the different options, and, the, and this can be an interesting point of view that we can explore further, but not now, since we are focusing now on another topic. Okay, my, the point that I raised here was uh, yeah, the point is we have humans in the loop and some people are not uh, in favor of it. Some people consider it uh, as a necessity. Uh, the, my, my question was more like, is it something, uh, can we consider humans in the loop as something that is a uh, kind of temporal situation as long as we don't have the technology to solve particular problems if we have no solutions, technical solutions, we simply have no other option as taking humans in the loop or is it really a, a matter of principle? Humans will be required, of course, not in all applications, but in certain applications, you can just not avoid them. So that was the point I raised. And uh, yeah, okay, if someone wants to put more uh, arguments on the table, feel free here. So I guess my response was that it's a uh, it's more of a principle. Humans, we're not 
we're not going to get humans out of all systems, right, in any way, right? We're, we're going to have systems that have to interact with humans. Um, we're going to have, and even, even if the system has full knowledge of the entire world, it's still going to have to interact with humans in many cases, smart buildings, cities, our lifestyle and stuff. And so if we ignore the human in the loop, then we're kind of ignoring this vast space. But the first thing, the, the long-term thing, in the, in the medium or short term, I don't think we're ever going to have models, even with learning or any of this kind of stuff, for a, a large majority of systems that model the world with enough fidelity that we would have we, we would be able to put the humans completely out of the loop. You know, so maybe in 20 years time, the, la the vast majority, or maybe in 20 years time, we'll have a lot of computing power and a lot of uh, ways of modeling the situation that we can get good fidelity. But that's 20 years of 20 years away. Um, and in the meantime, we're kind of ignoring that. Okay, thank you. I don't know if anyone wants to express some, some opinions on, on this before we close. Okay, Rogério, yes. Just very short. Um, I think you've got to distinguish the notion of you, what is human in the loop, all right? So I, I question, you know, I, there is, should be no humans in the loop, all right? So in other words, the human should not interact with the controller, which is slightly different humans interacting with the system. In my view, of course, system humans should interact with the system, but the system has got uh, has got has got the controller, and I question whether ever the human will be able to understand what is the operational state of the controller in order to affect the control. So well, the notion of this... human in the loop, all right? The notion of human in the loop should be questioned. Actually, what really we mean by human in the loop? Because you're messing around with the controller. We spend well, years and years building a controller. And you're messing around with the control. Right. Well, that's the challenge of the explainability stuff, right? And being able right. to give people yeah. a good um, state. We're seeing this with machine learning now, right? We're getting decisions based on machine learn, on machine learned algorithms and things like that, that humans don't know, even the developers don't know what it's about, right? And so they so there's a big um, emphasis on explainability of machine learned things. With control was even something as simple as my air conditioning in my office. I don't know anybody who's happy with the temperature all the time of the state. Of the of the of the um, of the temperature in their office in their building, um, and even if even in smart buildings, right? I need to have some way to be able to interact with the controller either to turn it off completely, which is it, which is um, you know completely um, shutting down the controller, or even in more subtle ways, right? Uh, okay, so uh, 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 so sorry. I, I think that uh, this is being a great discussion, and this was a. A great session indeed i think that we unfortunately we have to 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 stop here so because we already consumed the, the time of the interval uh thank you to everyone and to the to the, mainly to the authors and then to everyone that, that that joined the discussion um see you in the in the next session that is that is starting thank you